So I like to uh, remember, um, there's two events that I like to remember. Uh, one is, is the, a time, I think it was around nine, 1998 when um, Nelson Mandela was invited as president of um, South Africa to visit um, either Congress or the Senate in the United States to give a talk to the American government. And after that uh, talk, he came out and uh, the building is on top of um, like a flow of steps down cascading away in front of the building. And outside on these steps, the uh, international press were arranged and the acting president at that time was uh, Bill Clinton and he was in his second term as a young, powerful um, president of a superpower, a younger man. I think he was probably in his early 50s at that point. And uh, Nelson Mandela was a, a man, I'm not sure of his age at that stage, but maybe uh, 60s, late 60s, 70s. And he walks in a very slow, dignified kind of way Whereas uh, Bill Clinton was a you know, young, energetic man, full of his power. So the two of these presidents were walking out of the building and as they came down the steps, Bill Clinton moved ahead of Nelson Mandela, sort of carried in the sway of his power and his importance. But also, um, as they move down the steps, Bill Clinton is very sensitive to the crowd. So he was aware that the reporters were obviously paying great attention to him, but also to somebody moving behind him. And he stopped and uh, became self-conscious, aware, and stopped and waited for Nelson Mandela to catch up and offered him his hand of support for this older gentleman. And they walked down together. And afterwards he was being asked by one of the press, why did he stop? And I always remember him saying, even as president of the United States, I didn't feel it was my privilege to walk ahead of Nelson Mandela. I like to remember this situation, or I put my own mind into it, I create my own story around that, of the natural respect that we can have for somebody who is a, a great leader. Similarly, I like to think about the 2000 Olympics here in Australia and Sydney, and the poster poster girl of the Olympics was Kathy Freeman. So she was under tremendous pressure from the media and press as the, you can almost say the image, the physical uh, symbol of the Olympics. So she was on posters and she was on interviews, promoting Australia, promoting uh, its activity, its duty, its care as, as a host of the Olympics and that all Olympians and the international attention that it was drawing was welcome by Australians and by the Australian people and especially by the Aboriginal people as well. So on top of this burden was also added that uh, she needed to do well herself in her own races. So for those of us who can remember the final of the 400 meters, any event like that, a final in an Olympics, uh, most athletes will only maybe have one shot at, at the, the Olympics. That was her second Olympics. So it was probably her last Olympics. It was her last Olympics. She retired afterwards. So there's a huge pressure and you're down at the starting block and you're feeling the pressure of the 90 or 100,000 people in the stadium 
and even though it's a 400 meter, which isn't necessarily the, the biggest race on the, the list, because of her statute, the eyes of the world were on her, maybe a billion people on television watching at that moment. So it's a tremendous level of exposure. And she's wearing a, a suit, it's a full body suit, it's not the usual. And it's out of respect for her tradition, for her culture. And she's got this pressure on her shoulders. And she has to put that aside and just focus on her every step and every stride and her response to her training, allowing her training to happen. And she runs down the track. And because the track is curved and it's a 400 meter race, it's not obvious who's going to win for until they hit the straight. But it's amazing her composure if you watch and she won that race. And then she got to run with the flags and she carries the Australian flag. People don't realize there's three Australian flags. There's the one with the, the stars, the Southern Cross. There's the Aboriginal flag and the Torres Straits Island flag. These are the three official flags but only one was registered as an official flag for the Olympics. So she carried two, her own Aboriginal flag and the national flag. So we can have respect for people. So this quality is called Bhagavato. Bhagavato. In Pali we say Bhagavato one worthy of respect. So today we have been reciting Namo Tassa Bhagavato Arahato Samma Sambuddhasa. So I'd just like you to call to mind somebody, some event that you felt respect rising in your heart. This quality of the heart, Bhagavato. And usually when we, when we are in the presence of somebody worthy of respect, we, we show some sign of respect towards that person. Maybe we put our hands in Anjali Maybe we stand, all rise. All rise for our honored guest. All rise for this great person in our company. All rise in respect for the great behavior or great achievement of this person. All rise. So similarly, we can just scan down through our body parts, just having great respect for our own different parts of our own body. So all rise for the top of my head. I'm just using this expression, all rise, but just to invoke this sense of uh, a call to respect. All rise for the top of my own head. So I pay respect to the top of my head in whatever way is meaningful to me. All rise for the back of my head. Again, the head is one of the most important parts of the body. In many cultures, a disrespect towards the head is disrespect. All rise for the right side of my head. And all rise for the left side of my head. All rise for my forehead, the front of my head. Sometimes we bow down, touching the forehead to the ground as a sign of respect. All rise. Or we touch the front of our head with our hands in Anjali. 
all rise. All rise to my eyes. Again, how we look is very important. Sometimes in Aboriginal culture, we shouldn't look somebody in the eye directly. All rise for my eyes. In other cultures, it's very important to, to look somebody in the eye respectfully. All rise for my nose. Again, in many cultures, they'll cut your nose off as a, a marking. So somebody without a nose is somebody who has lost face. All rise for my nose. All rise for my mouth. Again, whether we're smiling or frowning, our mouth is very important. As a sign of respect towards a person, we smile. All rise. All rise for my neck. Again, if we're too stiff in our neck, we can't bend. It's considered haughty. So all rise for my neck. And when we're in the presence of somebody who we deeply respect, obviously our chest, our shoulders relax. We're not tensed up. So again, we put down any burdens, any other things are not as important as having respect for this, this person. So we put down any concerns about the past, any tensions, any anxiety about the future. All rise from my shoulders. Then our arms, the strength of our arms, all rise for my arms. Again, often we are in the Anjali, so our arms are a very important part of our respect. All rise for my hands my fingers, palms, all rise. And our chest, sometimes our chest fill with pride or respect, great respect in our chest, in our lungs. All rise for our lungs, for my lungs. And our heart, it's a great pleasure to be in someone who is worthy of great respect. All rise, all rise for my heart. Feeling that deep happiness in the heart to meet somebody worthy of great respect, a great honorable person. All rise for my stomach and intestines solar plexus, stomach, intestines, this whole region of the body. Then we can be inspired by the great courage of, of a true hero, all rise. These people have real guts, all rise. And we come to the back and spine, the upper back, middle back, lower back, radiating ribs, spinal cord. Again, the true hero has, has integrity. They have a, a great back. There are people we want at our back. All rise for my back. Uh, we come to our pelvis, hips. Again, all rise for our pelvis and hips. Like a hero, they have great Solidity, firmness, composure, just like our hips and pelvis. And all rise for our thighs. Again, even just the action of standing up, our thighs are these great strong muscles that help us to move. All rise. And for our knees, Again, when we pay respect, sometimes we bow down. All rise from my knees. Shin and calves. 
all rise for our shin and calves. Sometimes we have a spring in our steps if we we're happy to meet somebody who's who's our hero, somebody we respect greatly. Then all rise for my heel, ankle, foot, toes. Again, sometimes we bow down to people's feet as a mark of great respect to our parents, to our heroes. All rise for my feet. So let's put all of these different body parts together again, the feet, the legs, the torso, the arms, the neck and the head. And let's pay great homage and respect to our own body and mind, to my own body and mind. All rise for my own body and mind with great respect. And just as I wish to have respect for myself, so too can I overflow the sense of respect like an overflowing fountain of joy in all directions for everyone in this room, all rise for everybody else in this room, for each and every person in this room with great respect to each and every body in this room, each and every person, all rise in great respect for each other in this room. And we radiate out further with great respect to our fellow citizens of Melbourne this morning, this beautiful spring morning. All rise with great respect to our fellow citizens of Melbourne. And all rise for for all of our citizens, our fellow Australians this morning, across this whole continent. And like an overflowing fountain, we continue to overflow it to our surrounding neighbors. All rise for our neighbors. New Zealand, Indonesia, all rise with great respect for our neighbors. And as we move through Southeast Asia, from the Philippines to Malaysia, Singapore, Thailand, Burma, Laos, Cambodia, this whole region, all rise with great respect to our Southeast Asian friends and family. And as we follow the sun towards the west, all rise with great respect for our South Asian friends, Sri Lanka, India, Bangladesh, Nepal, Pakistan, this whole region, all rise with great respect. Great respect for great leaders like Gandhi, the Buddha, the great Arahants, whatever inspires you, all rise for South Asia. And as we move through the Middle East from Afghanistan across Iran, Iraq, Syria, Israel, Palestine, Yemen, this whole region, all rise with great respect. Great civilizations of the Sumerians, the Babylonians, great, great civilizations of this region across great times and all rise for this, the noble qualities of this region. We move through the, through to Africa. Again, we have Egypt, to Morocco, to South Africa. From the mighty pyramids and the great civilizations all the way through the mighty Nile to South Africa. All rise for all of our African friends, family, leaders. And we come to Europe 
from Italy to Scandinavia, from Portugal to Turkey, from Russia to Ireland, all rise for, for Europe, for the noble people of Europe, maybe great scientists like Einstein, great writers like Shakespeare. We can think of our heroes, people we admire. We come to the Americas, South America, Central America, North America, again, great civilizations, culture, Incas, or maybe just the achievements of, of putting an astronaut on the moon, whatever inspires your mind, all rise. It's great respect for our American friends and colleagues, family. Again, we cross over now the Pacific to Japan, Korea, China, Vietnam, or Mongolia, Tibet. We can all rise with great respect. Whatever inspires your mind, great writers, scientists, leaders, from history, from the present, the magnificent achievements of cultures in this region, all rise with great respect for the Far East. So as we step back from this planet, this planet Earth, maybe we can appreciate that every hero that has ever arisen has arisen on this planet Earth that we know of. The blue oceans, the great land masses, the great islands, the rivers, the lakes, the clouds, the polar caps, all rise with great respect to all living beings on this planet Earth our fellow citizens, of our fellow earthlings, all rise with great respect for all living beings on this planet Earth. So we pay great Anjali, great respect, great puja towards this planet Earth. Again, putting down this planet Earth with great respect, all living beings. I like to walk over to the center of the solar system to where the sun is, and just relax and rest there. And as I rest in the place of the sun, like if it was a golden sofa or floating on a swimming pool, I just overflow in all directions, north, south, east, west, above and below. Great respect, sharing this puja, this Anjali in all directions for all beings, with great respect in my heart, for all beings in all directions. All rise for all beings in all directions in this majestic universe all around us in all directions. Whatever living being there may be, whether they are weak or strong, the great or the mighty, medium, short or small, all rise with great respect for all beings in all directions, outwards and unbounded, freed from any hatred or ill will, all rise with great respect for all beings in all directions. And as I breathe in and breathing out, it connects me with the self and the whole universe. And the whole universe is connected with this self through the action of the breath, breathing in and breathing out. So I can just gently rest my attention on the breathing in and out 
and this connection between self and the whole universe with great respect, respect for myself, respect for others, respect for us, respect for we, breathing in and breathing out with great respect for all beings, self and others, overflowing in respect for self and sharing that great respect with all beings in all directions. All rise for all beings in all directions. Breathing in and breathing out with great respect. Respect for the breath itself. Respect for its support, for our life function, for our existence. Great respect for the mind that knows the breathing going in and out. This kaya nupasana. Sinking deeper and deeper into the experience of the breath as it's experienced mentally and physically by the body, by the mind. This remarkable connection between ourselves and the whole universe around us through the breath. And this relationality, our relationship with the whole universe around us in all directions. With great respect.
if you wish, you can use a mantra to help focus your mind on the breathing in and breathing out. I like to use the mantra, Sa, Do. Because when sometimes in Buddhism we want to share our respect for something worthy of our honoring, we put our hands in Anjali with great respect and say, Sadhu. So sometimes it's a nice mantra to have with our breath going in and out with great respect. Sadhu. Seeing the breath as precious. It's a great support in my life. So every breath from the beginning, middle and end, we pay great attention, great care with great respect. Breathing in, breathing out, beginning, middle and end. Sa, do. So it's this mental quality is our object of meditation, this quality of respect itself, Bhagavato. Sa do.
We're taking this quality of the mind of excellence, respect worthiness, respectfulness, this transaction of seeing the excellence, the noble, the blessed, the respectful, and the act of respecting itself as our object, breathing in and breathing out with great respect. Well, as we start to come towards the end of this uh, guided meditation, maybe we can reflect on the qualities of the heart, this experience. How does it feel like to have cultivated this quality of the mind, of respect, of uh, appreciating or diving into this excellence, blessedness? where we exercise the muscle of, of great respect, all rise. Does this feel heavy or light? Does this feel like going from a dark place to a brighter place or from a bright place to an even brighter place? Or are we going from a bright place to a dark place when we practice this state of mind? cultivating it, growing it? Is this awkward? Or is it malleable and wieldy and soft? What is the experience? What is the tone? What is the ambience? What is the atmosphere of this state of mind? Is this comfortable or uncomfortable? Am I at ease or dis-ease? Am I bending away from things, repulsed, or am I bending towards things? Do I feel harsh or gentle? How do I feel in my heart right now? What is the felt experience of 
this contemplation on Bhagavato and on this beautiful quality that most defined in many ways the quality of the Buddha himself. So when we say the Blessed One, we're saying this Bhagavato, worthy of great respect. And also overflowing it from our own self-respect, our own self-regard in a healthy, functional way. One of the reasons I, this came to my mind today was I was reading about um, in NASA, they have um, dedicated a building in honor of a lady who used to work for NASA for almost 30 years or more. And her name was, uh, her name is, she's still alive, is Elizabeth Johnson. And um, she's an African-American lady who was hired in the maybe early 1950s and she was very very good at mathematics so she's one of the first people in first Afri African Americans to have a degree in mathematics and because of her talent at mathematics and geometry in particular she was employed by NASA to calculate the launch window for rockets and then also for the trajectory that the rockets went on. So even though John Glenn, he's a very famous astronaut, he was the first American into space. He became a senator later on in life. He only died recently. He's considered one of these national heroes in the United States. He wouldn't fly if it wasn't the flight path wasn't uh, signed off by this lady. So she was one of the invisible people in the background that did the hard work of calculating these very, very difficult calculations. As we all joke in life, this ain't rocket science, but with her, that was rocket science, it really was. And let me tell you, the calculations are very, very complicated. Very complicated. So she had to do it by hand. H-A-N-D with a slide ruler. You can find those things in museums. And maybe a calculator. A thing that had buttons and you cranked it once you got to the end of a number. But she was probably very fast at doing it in her own head. As a child, she could remember how many steps it was from her house to the church door, how many plates she had washed and cleaned. She started high school at 10 and she completed it at 14. She graduated with a degree at 18. So uh, she received a presidential medal of honor from President Obama, in honor of her work, and in accepting it, she said she didn't really feel like she deserved it particularly herself because it was a team effort, but she acknowledged and accepted it nonetheless. So she has a building named after her now by NASA. It's a computational building in NASA. 
in the time that you worked for NASA, there was discrimination. There was separation. There was segregation. She had to drink from a coffee pot that said colored coffee, as opposed to white coffee. If she wanted to go to the bathroom, she had to go to another building, colored toilets. So she was asked, how did you deal with separation, segregation and discrimination? She said, those things existed, but I didn't feel them. So this is the real reason I wanted to discuss this, was there's a difference between what we think and what we feel. And in Pali, there's three words we use frequently around the mind. One is mano, chitta, and vijnana. These are the three different words we tend to use around the mind. So the Buddha is distinguishing these different qualities or aspects of the mind. So sometimes we say nama rupa, even in my guided meditation, I'm talking about giving respect to our body and we break it all down, different body parts. And then we're focusing today on this one quality of the mind, bhagavato, respectfulness. We're illuminating it, we're growing it, we're cultivating it, we're tasting it, we're exercising it, we're developing it, strengthening it. It's the quality of the mind. So there's body and mind, nama and rupa. Rupa is body, head, arm, elbow, bits, pieces, right? Materiality, rupa. Nama means name, the thing that names. So the mind is the thing that is naming things and it bends towards its object. This is its characteristic, mind bends towards things. So, but it seems that the use of certainly a lot of frequency of use of the word mano is around the thinking of the mind, the thoughts, right thinking, these kind of things. Whereas chitta is referring a lot more to the heart qualities, the felt experience of the, the mind, the mind that feels. And then chitta is consciousness. It's referring to the fundamental quality of the mind the chitta, the, the vijnana, the consciousness. So we re in Buddhism, we believe that there is an entity, there is a thing, there is a phenomena called mind. So this is what we refer to as chitta, as vijnana, consciousness. It is conscious. The thing that is conscious is the vijnana, the consciousness. So there is a, a vijnana datu, the element of consciousness. So we, we accept ab initio, from the start, that there is, an ent there is a phenomena called consciousness. There is a thing, consciousness. I like an Australian philosopher, David Chambers. He feels that this is a much more practical way of dealing with the hard problem of consciousness, is that we accept that consciousness exists. Because for many scientists, it's very difficult for them. Consciousness is very hard to show its existence in many ways. We can't stick it under a microscope, do a staining on it and illuminate it and say, there you go, there's consciousness. But consciousness is very easy for us to demonstrate that it exists, just as I can easily demonstrate to you that gravity exists. You know, I, if I want to prove gravity, I don't have to prove there is gravity, I can show it exists, there it goes, right? Gravity is happening. Well, we can all do a consciousness experiment. Would any of you like to me to demonstrate to you that you have consciousness? Would you like an easy experiment on this? So just hold your breath. Take a deep inhalation, right? Take a deep inhalation, right? But I didn't ask you to let it go. Just hold it. Watch your breath. Hold on to your breath. Hold on to your breath. Keep going. Okay. 
Anyone let go? No, what let go? I didn't ask you to let go, all right? Why did you let go? It's just body, isn't it? No? What happened? Hmm? You know, I, I, don't, I don't have to, it'll, it'll keep like that all the time, right? Pretty much, it'll just decay according to entropy, according to physical. No consciousness. Conscious. If I fall over and die, just right in front of you now, that sometimes that happens. What's the difference? What, what changed? It's still the same, right? It's still the same rupa. What changed? What happened? Hmm? There is a phenomena. So sometimes it's just good to say, accept, there is a phenomena, rather than, I'm not really sure that there's a consciousness because we can't detect it. Oh, I'm not really sure there's a gravity either because I can't find the, the gravity particle. Maybe we did with the Higgs. I'm not sure. I, I didn't. I think they're still trying to work harder on the Higgs to find out if that even is mass. We can't even detect mass, the origin of mass. Very difficult. So things, sometimes we have to accept as a starting point. So we start with consciousness, meaning vijnana. And then we start to look at the different qualities and aspects and behaviors of consciousness or of the mind. And then we start to see, well, there's this pattern of mano, thinking, and citta, feeling, heart. <coughs> and it's quite interesting that if we look into our mind, we have a left hemisphere and a right hemisphere, or our brain. If we look at our brain, there's a left and a right hemisphere. And there's a lot of talk about this left and right as if they were different. Both work together to help us to exist in the world. But certainly the left seems to be very, um, it likes things, it puts things in sequence. The left seems to be more associated with thinking, with, with mano. It uh, likes telling stories, narratives, and it holds things in mind. So sometimes when we're breathing in and breathing out, we can say to our mind, pay attention to the breath, but then our perception, our experience of the breath can disappear or can change. But we need to keep watching that area of the body where the breathing happens. So sometimes it will disappear and it'll come back again. So the commentators describe it as like a little boy who's looking after the cattle. In the old days, you had a cow herder, cow herding boys. And they would bring the cattle to the forest and the cattle would go into the forest. And in the evening time, they would have to ground up the cattle out of the forest. But it would be very hard to find them inside in a forest. So they would normally wait by the drinking pool for the cattle to emerge because cattle always need water. And they will come out to the drinking pool and then they will round them up from the drinking pool. So the same with our breathing. Sometimes we have to pay attention to, to the area the location, the domain of the breathing. <coughs> so this is a very important skill to hold in mind, what am I doing? What is my, what is my object of meditation? And where does it arise? Where is its domain? What is its domain? So this ability to put a field, to create a field of attention is a very important skill and this is something that maybe the left side of the brain is doing and this is something that we also call mano, a quality of the mind. So there's another skill of the mind which is associated with the right side of the mind and that's more to do with the continuity of experience. So in the continuity of experience, the labels and the definitions and the boundaries are not as important as the felt experience of the event, of the phenomena itself. So we feel into the breath. So as we are doing the guided meditations with you today, I start out with a lot of categories and boundaries and images and, you know, 
we're here in the, the room or all the different body parts and all of the different parts of the world and the planet and the solar system. We're moving through a lot of different categories. This very left side, this is very Mano. But all the time I'm trying, we're trying to direct and cultivate and grow this quality of respect. Chitta, heart, mind, heart, heart qualities. So we need to bring together these two qualities of Chitta and Mano, mind thinking, mind feeling the heart and the mind or the the logic and the heart together so that we have this whole experience and the sum is greater than the individual parts and then this way we are accessing chitta itself mind meaning vijnana consciousness and we're cultivating different qualities of our mind different mind states mental states so this is very useful We'll be talking about it later on in the Sutta class. One of the elements that we'll be talking about is vijnana. But here we are today dealing with Bhagavato, this quality of the mind, respect. And most Buddhists, as they, the very first thing they'll ever hear and the very first chant they'll ever learn is Namo Tassa Bhagavato Arahato Sama Sambuddhasa. And they'll also learn the other Pali word, which is sadhu, sadhu, sadhu. So sadhu means basically excellent. It's a rejoicing in something excellent. That's excellent. Well done. Excellent. So this is synonymous with respect. With something is respect, worthy of my respect. Again, a very important sutta for me is the Mangala Sutta. So the first line is Asewanacha Bala Nang Pandita Nancha Sewana Puja Cha Puja Nyanang Etang Mangala Mutamang Chi. So it means avoid fools, associate with the wise. Puja Cha Puja Nyanang Reward or Reward Offer your puja offer your support to the wise. Etang mangala mutamang ti, that will be auspicious. Auspicious here means a good cause and condition. It will be a wholesome cause and condition for your prosperity, right? It's auspicious. I don't mean auspicious in a lucky sense of the word. You will reap as you sow auspicious, it will be auspicious, a good sowing. So too often in our life we put too much time into foolishness, our own foolishness and others, the foolish behaviors of ourselves and others. So we reward, we offer puja to fools, we vote for fools, we spend our time with fools, we spend our resources on foolishness. In this case, it's not auspicious. The wise, it's very useful to spend time in association with wise states of mind, wise behavior, and reward it, cultivate it, give it love, give it attention, give it support. Puja, like a puja, make a great offering, offering of your body, of your speech, and of your mind towards this wiseness. I tried to find out how many universities in the world study wisdom, have research departments on wisdom. I think you could do a worldwide survey and find that everybody on the planet agrees that wisdom is a good thing. How many universities do you think study wisdom? Faculty of Wisdom, Department of Experimental Research on Wisdom, hmm? RMIT, Monash, Latrobe. Where do you think even wisdom is discussed in the university? Philosophy Department? Hmm? Very few places in the whole planet. Very few places in this whole planet. Huh. 
hard to even find a definition of wisdom. What are the characteristics? So we think that wisdom is great, but we haven't got the first clue what it is. We can put rockets into space. We can put astronauts on the moon. We can do these very complicated geomet geometric calculations. But we don't know what wisdom is. We don't make a priority out of it. We don't puja it enough in society, in the world. So there's a difference between logic and feeling, between mano and chitta. There are different aspects of mind, but we need to bring these things together. We might think something is right, like it might be okay to discriminate for whatever reason. We have a category, very left brain of us, we discriminate. But does it feel right? You can do this experiment yourself, go down to any shop here. You've got a fine selection, Aldi, Lidl, wherever. And just look at the cornflakes boxes. All the different brands of cornflakes or cereal. They're all good. Nutrition on the side of the box. Mix it with milk. It'll make an okay breakfast for you, maybe. Or you go down to the milk section. You look at all the different kinds of milk skim, lactose-free, full cream, half cream, light, soya, which is, which is right, right? They're all right, actually. The delta is going to be which feels right. I think soya is right, but I don't feel like it. This is the playing that's going on between mano and chitta, between the heart and the mind, between the thinking and the feeling. So I could really admire that lady who could know and acknowledge that there was discrimination, who had to live with it, but she didn't feel it. She didn't make importance of it. She didn't prioritize it. She got on with her job because she enjoyed her job. She loved her job. She loved problem solving. She loved that she was very good at it. And she didn't let people stand over her. She didn't allow people to put their name on her report, even though it was the practice at that time that a woman couldn't put a woman, not a black woman, a woman, a white woman or a black woman could not put her name on a report. It had to have a male name on the report, right? didn't feel right. So I've always felt it in the most phenomenal waste and just such a joy in my life is knowing and having the diversity of people, of food, of cultures, of different things in the world. And I understand that's just something genetic in me and it may be just something to do with my cultivation, my upbringing, but it's been a really great asset in my life. I've managed many teams and I've always found that the person who had a, a different take on things often gave the most valuable contribution. They were the person that didn't quite agree with what I was doing. And I listened to what they had to say and I thought, oh, that's, that's actually a really good point. I hadn't considered that and it made the whole thing very helpful, very, very beneficial. So there's this huge difference between skeptics and cynics. We need to be careful of the difference. Skeptics are people who are willing to look into things. They see, they see something maybe not quite right and they look into it. A cynic is that they just see the fault in things. It's a form of anger. Cyn skeptics can be very inquiring, inquisitive, playful, creative. A cynic is a negative unhelpful, fault-finding. So 
So these are just different sides of our own mind. And we can cultivate these different aspects of our mind. And facing new ideas and new changes and that constant force that exists in the world. There isn't just gravity in the world. There's also anicca, change, constant change. The only certainty in this world is change itself. You can bet on change. You know, you better not bet on permanence because you'll certainly lose, you know? So Melbourne is having a good time at this moment, 10 years in a row, most inhabitable place in the world. But it'll change, it'll change. It's just the nature of it. It's not that Melbourne is a bad place, it's a great place. Not that the people of Melbourne are bad people, they're great people, but it'll change, fixed law. I don't know when, I don't know where, I don't know why, it'll change. It'll change. And we need to change our mind with it. And chitta, heart, is very good at changes. Coping with changes, recovering from changes, dealing with changes. Mano is not too good with changes. It doesn't, you know, it, it has an idea, it has a fixed category, it has a, a box. Things go into that box. And boxes are useful. They're very helpful to have categories. It's very, very helpful. You know, we need to know what the rule is before we learn about the exception is. I used to try to help people learn English, spoken English. Can you imagine? It's a nightmare. You're trying to explain why, what's the rule, and then the 10 million exceptions to the rule. You know, I think a lot of other Asian languages are much better at that. You know, if you learn Sanskrit or Pali or something, they're extremely rigid. The rule is the rule is the rule, you know? English, the exception is the exception is the exception. <sighs> and it's just an accident. It's just an accident that English is, is perhaps the most powerful language in the world. Just an accident of history of time, of place. From the 1200s to the, about 1750, in science you, you had, to, had to write in Latin. Up to very recently you had to have Latin for, ma for your medical exams. So there's people here who probably had to have Latin as part of their medical qualifications. Latin was one of the most useful languages in the world, dead. It's not a useless language. It was the language of the Roman Empire. Tremendous empire. Gone. Egyptians, one of the most powerful empires of all time. Maybe 4,000 years. 4,000 years there was an empire, an Egyptian empire. You know, and these days we are all excited about the American superpower. It's not even 100 years. 4,000 is a lot more than 100 years, guys. Think about it. <laughs> you know? Those pyramids are still standing. They're big. We still talk about things as how many Giza's in size is that, you know? Right? So get to know the mind, knowing the heart. This is meditation. This is our duty. Cultivating the healthy aspects of our mind, the skillful aspects of our mind, the, the auspicious aspects of our mind. This is our duty. And avoiding the foolish aspects of our mind, not giving it the same attention. You know, the squeaky wheel gets all the grease, as they say here, you know. We need to give attention to these less squeaky wheel sides of ourselves, these good aspects. You know, sometimes when we're sick and ill, we can give too much attention to the sickness and the illness. We need to also give attention to the other healthy areas of the body. You know, sometimes when we're in critical speech mode, we're giving too much attention to the fault, not to the good aspects. Sometimes we give it too much attention to the trauma and not the recovery. This is the nature. We need to look into this balancing between our heart and our mind, between mano and chitta. 
we need to use you know rules of thumb categories skillfully and well and they're helpful they're a good starting point but sometimes we need to put them aside because they don't reflect the actual experience of reality of the world itself so there is this interaction with the world we interact with it through this aspect of mano and of chitta and the thing that knows that is consciousness itself. So the mind is a very intriguing quality or property. It can know itself, it cannot know itself. And stupid is as stupid does. This good definition of wisdom. It ain't rocket science. It's just doing stupid things because we did stupid things or doing wise and skillful things and we rewarded those wise and skillful things. Okay. If you have any questions on today's talk, I'd be happy to. Did you enjoy it? Did it feel good to you? How does, what is your felt experience? I felt what? How? today? One word, two words, anybody? Sad, dejected, in despair, diseased, no? Appreciative, Appreciative. okay. Calm. Calm. Unhappy, miserable, dark, gloomy, stiff, angry, resentful. No? You didn't feel any of these things? Humbled? So just know that the fools hang out together. And the wise hang out together. Right? Fix law. Avoid the fools. Associate with the wise. And reward the wise. So well done to all of you. Excellent, excellent, excellent. Sadhu, sadhu, sadhu. Wow.